everybody, this is Gene Marks, and welcome back to another episode of Biz Books, where we talk to great authors of great business books about their book. Thank you so much uh, for joining me this time, both on YouTube and through our social channels. I am here sp speaking uh, with Julia Borston. Julia has written, uh, her book is called When Women Lead, What They Achieve, Why They Succeed, and How We Can Learn From Them. So Julia, first of all, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you so much for talking to me about my book and thank you for reading it and liking it. Yeah, I read it. I loved it. I have a bunch of questions. I have like, you know, we have a lot to talk about. Uh, first of all, Julia, let's give a little background on yourself. So you're, you're a, a media and tech correspondent for CNBC. That is what you're doing now. Um, yes. Give us a little bit about your history and how you came to write the book. So I've been a business reporter for 22 years. Uh, straight out of college, I became a reporter for Fortune Magazine. I was at Fortune for six years. In that time, I became a contributor to CNN. Of course, back then, uh, both CNN and, and Fortune were owned by the same parent company. And there, I covered a wide range of companies, um, from retail to media, um, some investing stories, um, really digging into some of the, the companies that are shaping our, our culture, like Whole Foods or, or, or uh, retail executives like Mickey Drex or who ran Gap and then J. Crew. Um, so really had a great career there, but then I made the transition to television and I've been at CNBC for 16 years. Okay. In that time, I started off as a media reporter, um, then moved into social media. Now I'm senior media and tech reporter. And what's so interesting is that these worlds have really converged. Um, it's hard to talk about media without talking about tech and vice versa. But one of my favorite projects that I've done at CNBC is I created the Disruptor 50 list. Um, I created it about 11 years ago. And this has now become a year-long project. Um, but every year we announce the 50 fastest growing uh, venture-backed startups, private companies. And we use a, a combination of qualitative and quantitative metrics to identify this list. Um, but it be, has become sort of this year-round celebration of innovation and disruptive businesses and looking at what the next generation of innovative companies is going to be. And it's through that that I found some of the leaders that I profile in my book. Um, who do you want to read this book? Well, you know, uh, I, I feel like I wrote it for two different audiences. First, I really want men to read this book. I want men to read this book because there are so many remarkable women leaders who they may not be aware of. And I think it's really important for men to see some new patterns, some new models of what leadership can look like. And I hope that they will learn from these women and they will start to adopt some of these more traditionally female leadership styles, whether it's empathy or vulnerability or things like that. So I actually feel like men need to see the stories. And I also want men to understand the data. I right. can't tell you how many men have said to me, what do you mean women get two percent of got 2% of venture capital funding last year? What do you mean that women founders of companies got 3% of venture capital dollars for the past decade. Like that can't possibly be true, but the numbers are shocking, but they are true. And men need to understand them because they will be smarter, both financially and strategically for understanding the data. And then for women, I want them to understand that they have the leadership strengths and the ability to navigate the business world um, in themselves. And they don't have to try to fit into someone else's box or definition of leadership. And if I think back to the year 2000, when I became a business reporter, there was a very defined archetype of what a leader looked and sounded like. And maybe it had a little bit to do with the, the GE model and Jeff Immelt. But I think times have really changed. And I hope that the book can kind of offer a mirror for women and men to see some of their own traits and skills and strategies reflected in the remarkable women I write about in the book. You know, I, my big takeaway from this book was like, you know, the, the title of the book itself is it's when women lead. It's not how women can lead or why women can lead. It's when women lead, you know, it's like, it's not a book that is like making a plea to give women more chances. I mean, it's, it's kind of like saying like, kind of like saying fuck you to the people that still don't get it you know that when women run organizations they're just as good as men and in many cases even better and you back it up with data and stories does that make sense yeah, yeah i mean look I, it, I i'm i'm a journalist i am not um i am there are plenty of books that are telling women what to do to saying right. here's here's the confidence code these are great books like the confidence code light lean in they're giving women a prescription here's what you should do I am a journalist. I'm not telling people what to do. I'm showing them. Journalists are all about show, don't tell. 
And I wanted to tell these stories because if you don't have these examples, you can't even understand the statistics or the numbers. Um, and it's much harder to make changes in your own life if you don't have those stories to inspire you or to at least give you a roadmap of what to do. So for me, I wanted to start with the narrative. As a journalist, start with the narrative. Nothing is more powerful than a story. It's the story that sticks with you. When you're struggling in the middle of the night and you can think of a story of a woman who was able to overcome challenges, that's what you're going to remember at two in the morning when you're burning the midnight oil. And so I think it was really important to start with the stories because I do think that the model of show don't tell is what's most effective. And I think that I couldn't tell inspiring stories of amazing women without the data to back it up. And I think I sort of didn't realize when I started working on this book that it was going to be a research project. I had no idea I was going to end up reading 300 academic studies, yeah. but um, I realized in order for the numbers and, and the, the narratives of the power of these female leadership skills and strategies to be taken seriously and for people to really understand them, I needed the research um, to take this book to the next level. And, and I'm, glad I, I'm glad I went down this road. It would be a very different book if I didn't feel the challenge of, of backing everything up um, that I'm writing about, explaining all these stories with intense academic research. So speaking of academic research, so um, I'm going to throw a curveball at you right now that you'll easily be able to handle because this was not mentioned in your book because uh, there was a research report which just came out this week for McKinsey and Company, who you do mention in the book numerous times for, for various studies that they've done. So Julia, let me, let, me, let me tell you what this research said. It says, it, it talks about the metaverse, right? So it's Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse tech, you know, the virtual reality world that, that uh, your largest tech companies are working on building right now, okay? Um, and it talks about how women are being locked out, even now, out of leadership roles in all of the companies and platforms and technologies that are being developed for the metaverse. And just to throw out some data at you, because I know you like this stuff, this McKinsey report said that 41% of women have used a primary metaverse platform or participated in a digital world for more than a year, like gamers, you know, or whatever platform might be, but compared to 34% of men. So there's more women that are actually using metaverse you know, related technologies right now. It also says that women spend significantly more time on, on metaverse related tools, right? Uh, they, they're power users. They spend more than three hours a week compared with men who spend a little bit less than that. So maybe you know what's coming here because, uh, however, the, the study finds that women once again represent a minority in the metaverse economy. Uh, it finds out that most of the CEO and upper management roles of metaverse companies um, are, are still being run by men. You, you, know, you talk about this phenomena in the book. So let me start out with that. Um, tell, us, tell us why this is. What have you found? Well, I'll start you off with why it doesn't make sense, yeah. which is exactly what you laid out. You want people who are running companies, creating products and services to be reflective of the people they are serving. Right. They will be more successful if they are reflective of, of the, the broader public. I mean, think about it like, you, you know, if you're, if you're creating products and services for women, if women are 41% of your audience, why not have women involved in decision making? Um, same thing is true about racial diversity as well. It's not about... Being, being nice and, and inviting more women in. It's about being strategic and understanding how diversity is going to drive uh, successful business outcomes. As to the reason why, I think it comes back to the same reason why women aren't raising venture capital in anywhere near the same numbers as men are. And that comes down to this idea of pattern matching. I avoid the term unconscious bias because I think it's overused and it's almost lost its meaning, meaning because we use it so frequently. But this idea that um, whether they're executives or investors, people have a, have a pattern, have an idea of what engineers, what executives, what product managers should look like. And they hire people and put people um, into these roles that fit into their patterns. Um, there are obviously have been many conversations about a pipeline problem, um, fewer female engineers and there are male engineers, et cetera. But I think fundamentally, if you have people at the top who care about investing in diversity, they will invest in diversity. And if they don't, they won't. And so I, I think that there needs to be a shift in the narrative around the importance of diversity, whether it's 
uh, you know, in AI, there's been a lot of research about the negative implications of not having diversity in the people who are creating artificial intelligence, right? Mm-hmm. You have AI systems that aren't don't recognize women's faces or women of color. They don't see them because the AI has been trained um, on white men. And so that ends up having horrible implications for the, the potential of this technology. So um, so I think it needs to, we need to take a step back and say this is it's it's a mistake. Um, and whether it's a, a statistical error in that they they sort of kept on growing and the companies you know grew and hired more people like them. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say statistical error. That's the wrong word. Okay. Um, let me back up. So I say so whether it's it's a, an oversight um, or simply the result of companies growing quickly and not realizing the importance of investing in diversity. This is something that every company, whether it's about the metaverse. Um, or some other technology needs to be aware of because if you want your company to succeed, you you should be thinking about having people working at the company that reflect the audience. And I would just say one interesting thing about the metaverse is someone who covers meta and other metaverse related companies for CNBC, the metaverse aims to recreate the virtual, the, the, so let me do that again. The metaverse aims to recreate the, the real world on virtual sure. platforms. Right and make it more um, more accessible in a 3D virtual world. It's gonna be a long time before we actually get to that reality. But if you want the public to wanna to live in those virtual worlds, you're gonna to wanna to make it um, sort of convenient and accessible and attractive to them. And if it's created by men, it won't be as attractive to women. I do have to say on a positive note, because I'm fundamentally a very positive and optimistic person, there are some great organizations that are tackling this gender gap that you're talking about, one of which is called BFF. And it aims to educate women about cryptocurrency, about the metaverse, and about Web3. And this idea that you need a group of women to help bring more women in to this largely male-dominated world so far. You know, you mentioned about identifying patterns, and you talk in the book about pattern matching. Can you expand on that? And and for any women that are watching this or listening to this, how how do they overcome this? It's a dilemma of pattern matching. Well, I think men need to also figure out how to overcome it because they are missing out if they fall prey to pattern matching. Tell us what it is. So, okay. So unconscious bias is this idea that we all have biases that we are not aware of, and it impacts the way we make decisions in our everyday lives. Pattern matching is something very simple. It is not malicious. It's this idea that we all have the human instinct to try to create patterns and try to create to, to, and to try to fit people and ideas into patterns that we've already seen. Right. So for instance, if you're an investor and you get to make maybe 10 bets a year, you're going to want to look for someone who reminds you of someone who has succeeded for you as a founder in the past. You're going to be looking for someone who reminds you of Jeff, of Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos. You're going to be looking for someone who fits into the existing pattern of what a successful tech founder looks like. And guess what? There are many fewer examples of successful female tech founders. So that that is not as dominant a pattern for you to be trying to match into. Or even if you're a board and you're saying, okay, what does a successful CEO look like? We're going to appoint a CEO of our of our company. What do, what do successful CEOs look like? How do they behave? What's their background? And if you're looking for someone who ha- has an engineering degree and sold their last company to Microsoft, that limits that limits the field and you're dealing with a more narrow pattern. So what I argue is that this is a very human instinct. And as a result, we see the same patterns being perpetuated over and over and over and over. People are, it's harder to evaluate every situation, every individual on their own merits and set aside any patterns you may have in the back of your mind. Um, But that's what it takes to ultimately find new success stories, to create new patterns. You know, you you talk about those patterns, but you also, I mean, you tell so many stories in this book about women who overcame that. Um, I'm not going to pronounce her name. Like Senegina Zachariah? Senegina Zachariah, <laughs> okay. CEO of Insurify. Carla Gallardo, Shilpa Shah, uh, Shanlin Ma. I mean, you, you, you mentioned, you know, and there's just a few other stories. I, can, did you have any takeaways from the women that were able to overcome pattern matching, like how they were able to do that? Yes. Every woman in my book, I inter, I, I quote about 60 women in my book. I, <laughs> I profile several dozen and guess what? They all look and sound and behave in ways that are very different, not just from the male archetype, but from each other. Mm-hmm. I mean, just in that, in that five names you mentioned, these women are immigrants. 
These women did not speak English as their first language. Many of them, you know, they're not white. They're they're um, Indian American. They're um, Bulgarian. So they have all sorts of different backgrounds, and they lead and they think and they behave in very different ways in what has been traditionally associated with leadership. So what I would say is they overcame pattern matching in a couple of ways. First by um by understanding what they were up against and we all face bias in the world in various fa ways different kinds of unconscious bias women are far more likely to face um certain stereotypes that may hold them back at work but each of these women by learning what the obstacles were that they were facing were better able to navigate them and that's one reason why as a very positive optimistic person i thought it was incredibly important to lay out the data about double standards and bias in the book, A, so men can identify it to avoid falling prey to it, but so B, women can identify it so they could better navigate it. And I think that's that's sort of step one. Know your know your challenges. Um, I joke in the in the in the epilogue that before writing this book, I used to subscribe to the Serenity Prayer, trying not to spend any attention or any energy on the things I couldn't control. But reporting this book and following the success of these remarkable female leaders has totally transformed my perspective on that. Now I believe you need to understand the things you can't control. And if I could actually, if I could actually yeah. add into that, you, you to, and to, to complement what you're saying, uh, not only just needing to understand it, but you have to ask, right? I mean, you gave many examples of, of these entrepreneurs that these female entrepreneurs that maybe they didn't get the round of funding that they're expecting to get, but they didn't just give up on that. They, they went back to the potential investors and say, you know, why didn't I get this? You know, like, yeah. you know, what am I missing? You gave me, you gave one example of this again, this Shanlin Ma, where uh, this one investor, I think who turned her down said that, you know, every male entrepreneur bangs his fist on the table, swearing this will be a billion dollar business and you did not, right? <laughs> so without without asking, you're never going to know and, and you can't change whatever behavior or perception that you might be, that you might be giving, right? Exactly. So understanding those obstacles, understanding those double standards, but also being okay with failure. Each one of these women who ultimately had massive success mm. failed so many times. And one of the women I, I interviewed, Irma Olguin Jr., she said they pitched to a thousand investors. Yeah, that's a crazy. Thousand. I said, how is that even possible? It's crazy. And um, but they they were persistent. Um, they were persistent and they were determined. And sometimes they had some additional purpose in addition to just generating revenue that was essential to help them have that persistence um, and that courage to keep on going on. Um, and, and then the other thing I just have to say is that they were humble. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that Shanlin Ma went and asked that investor, why, why am I not succeeding here? She had the humility to understand that she didn't know everything. Yeah, you're right. She was going to have to change her approach. And I write a lot in the book about the importance of a growth mindset, which is something a lot of books, uh, business books talk about. But here in, in When Women Lead, I try to really break apart the pieces of the growth mindset um, and this idea that it's a combination of humility, understanding you have more to learn, and confidence, knowing you can con continue to grow. And applying that growth mindset, not just to each of us as individuals, but to your company. How can you hire with a growth mindset? Hire people who have the potential to grow into the roles just rather than hiring them based on what they're their previous experiences? How can you create a company that's constantly iterating and learning and not static? And I think applying that growth mindset across every parts, part of a business, not just to the individual, is, is really essential. Julia, what is the glass cliff phenomenon and why is that so important? So you've heard of the glass ceiling, the idea that women can rise through the ranks but never make it to the top because there's this invisible thing blocking them from getting there. The glass cliff is something that academics, uh, a, a term, let me back that up, sorry. The glass okay. cliff is a term coined by academics to explain this phenomenon in which women get hired into roles, senior leadership management roles, when a company is in a precarious position. And this was identified um, before the financial crisis, but you saw it in the financial crisis and you've also seen it during the pandemic. Boards say, we're gonna put a woman in as a CEO mm -hmm. and the company's doing terribly. So women are either hired because the board thinks there aren't any other options or things are already bad. So why not take a risk on a woman who may not traditionally have gotten access to this position? Right. So it's not a good position to be in, right? You know, the company is struggling, <laughs> the economy is in free for all. There are a million different challenges, but they put women in as CEO in those situations or women are more likely to be appointed in those situations. But here's the other really interesting thing is in those situations, women tend to outperform and the stocks tend, tend to rise after that. Um, also, there's other separate research that finds that in times of crisis, 
employees would rather have a, a woman at the helm, would rather have a female CEO. So I think the glass cliff is important to, 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 to identify, especially as you see headlines about, you know, company in free fall, horrible situation, woman gets put in as CEO. The risk of failure is incredibly high. Yeah. Um, uh, but also it seems like if women can, can, can succeed in those glass cliff situations, they should be given plenty of other opportunities when a, when a company isn't floundering. All right, you're making your case so far. Um, you write about um, three other entrepreneurs in the fashion industry, uh, Julia Wainwright, Katrina Lake, uh, and Jennifer Hyman. You said, and I wrote this down, they've done more to challenge the fashion industry status quo than any other three inch entrepreneurs, male or female. Um, why did you say that? And what can we learn from them? Well, I mean, obviously you have people like Jeff Bezos who have transformed retail um, sure. and e-commerce with Amazon. But if you look at the fashion ecosystem, the idea that fashion decisions are made and, and, and the designs are strutted down the runway, you have people at Vogue who are examining fashion, you know, six months in advance, because there's this whole system of when clothes are released, designs are released and sort of how the, the designs filtered down the food chain. Right. It was a very top-down approach that did not necessarily take into account what was best for the consumer at the end of that, of that food chain, um, at the end of that retail food chain. And we've seen three founder-led CEO, founder-led startups take their companies public. Mm -hmm. um, and those three women you mentioned, CEOs, the founder CEOs of Stitch Fix, The Real Real, and Rent the Runway, represent um, three of the roughly 20 founder CEOs who have taken their company public who are women in the past 20 years. Mm. So to have, it's just a, a very rare thing to have female founders be able to take their companies public as has happened just on, on, on 20 occasions. So what's so interesting is to have three of them, this critical mass in the retail space has had a big impact. Um, and it also reflects the fact that these women are really disruptive in this space. Now, if you look at Rent the Runway, that's all about shifting the ecosystem away from an ownership model where you have to own all of your clothes to an access model. You're renting your clothes. You only own maybe a handful of things that you wear all the time, but then the fashion pieces, everyone should be able to rent them and have access to things that they wouldn't afford, wouldn't be able to afford to own otherwise. If you look at the real real, it's about creating this new ecosystem where you own things, but temporarily, and then you could sell them back. And because it's all predicated on the value of luxury goods and the fact that they don't wear out easily, um, that those things should be kept in circulation, which by the way, is also better for the environment. So that's about creating the circular economy. And then if you look at what Katrina Lake did with Stitch Fix, she took a service which was reserved for the ultra wealthy or celebrities, which is the personal styling service, and she made that accessible to the masses. And I would argue that all three of these women really democratized the fashion and retail landscape in a way that we haven't seen before, taking luxury fashion and making it accessible or luxury uh, styling and making it accessible to the masses and really shook up the industry in a remarkable way. There's also this phenomenon that if you have three CEOs who've taken their companies public, which is incredibly rare, that ends up having an impact on the rest of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Back to the pattern matching, investors are saying, well, hey, Katrina Lake made a lot of money for her investors. Who's going to be the next Katrina Lake? So they've established this new pattern of founder CEOs who've been able to take their companies public in this retail space. And that, I would say, has fostered a lot more investment. Um, in that retail tech-driven ecosystem as a result of that. Unfortunately, a lot of those stocks have suffered as the whole tech sector has suffered since they've gone public. But I do think it's important to acknowledge the importance of a, of a critical mass and, and the relevance of what happens once you have a couple of success stories in a particular industry, because then that drives more innovation. You know, side story about Katrina Lake. She, my, my wife has been a Stitch Fix customer for years, like absolutely loves it. It's like, you know, Christmas, whatever, you know, whatever we get, you know, hey, uh, uh, she gets a package delivered. And then for like a number of months, she was like really disappointed in the offerings uh, of what was being sent to her. And we heard Katrina Lake uh, interviewed, I think Kara Swisher interviewed her, you know, on a podcast. And, um, you know, my wife, you know, I said, I just emailed a woman. I mean, like clearly, you know, you're right. Just, it's not that big a deal. And sure enough, she did. And of course, Katrina Lake responded um, directly. It's like the CEO of a public company, um, you know, and so like, you know, you know, obviously apologizing for the issue and trying to help her, you know, find somebody else that would help her more with, a, you know, it, it's, 
the reason why I tell that story is like, it's uh, you have to know your audience and it gets back to like the beginning of this conversation. It is nuts. When, when we saw this report about the metaverse, where you see more women are on the plat, you know, on metaverse platforms than men. And yet these men are still not getting it um, where they have women in re- leadership roles here. You've got women in leadership roles in some of these fashion companies. They're they're You know, they know their customers really well. It's exactly who you want to have running these companies, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And there's one of, one of the um, investors I interviewed named Frida Kapoor Klein. She, one of the key criteria she looks for in her startup founders is proximity. What is their proximity to the problem they're solving? How well do they understand the challenge, the opportunities, the market? Because if you're going to be a customer, you're going to understand the, the product better than if you're up in an ivory tower or in a corner office trying to, trying to imagine what women might be interested in buying or spending money on. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I do wonder if that McKinsey report has any impact, probably not on the, uh, on the, on the platforms, you know, these metaverse platforms uh, or, you know, as well, maybe somebody smart will figure that out. Okay. Let's keep moving on. Um, you, you talk about decision-making as well. And again, you, you cite like uh, numerous studies throughout this book. One study that you, that you cited was, uh, was how men, um, it, it was a conclusion of a neuroscientist who said that men are more eager to take risks but women have a more practical approach. What are your what are your thoughts on that study? And do you do you agree with that? Well, I would say that that I mean, not that 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 really sort of gets to the heart of the the findings in that study. Mm-hmm. But I think that especially in times of crisis or when um, when the, the stakes are high, men are more likely to take risk. And this idea that. Um, you know, there are various ways to look at risk taking. Obviously, to be a successful entrepreneur in any business, you need to take some risk, but you want to take thoughtful risk that's based on data, not on instinct, um, not on uh, not on impulse, or not based on your commitment to a plan that you made a year ago that may not be as relevant as it used to be. Um, there, there's an interesting study of the performance of female-led banks during the financial crisis, mm-hmm. regional banks, and it's actually fairly easy to compare regional banks um, and how they fare during the financial crisis. And what they found is that the female-led banks outperformed the male-led banks. And they were trying to understand why. Was that was there something women did during the financial crisis to better manage the outcomes for, for their banks? And in fact, it came back to the risk-taking. Yep. Leading up to the financial crisis, in that time, male-led banks were taking bigger risks with, with their funds, with their approaches, whereas the, the female leaders were more cautious. And I think that's the thing. It's like this idea of being adaptable, but also being prepared and not taking too many risks going into something is really essential. Um, there's another piece of this that plays into the risk-taking um, and decision-making in times of crisis that I think is really essential. And that is a, taking a communal approach to decision-making. And the archetype of male leadership is top-down, hierarchical. I'm making the decision in the corner office, and I'm going to delegate it to my to my team. Women are far more likely to take a communal approach to management, pulling on perspectives from across their organization. And I would say, especially in heightened uh, in times of heightened uncertainty or crisis, that approach, a communal approach, is going to serve you in good stead. And that's because things are changing quickly. Thinking about the pandemic. Situations were so varied across the country, the leaders who leveraged the perspectives of their teams were going to be a lot more effective because you couldn't possibly understand what was going on um, by by being alone in your office or isolated in your home. And so I think that risk taking um, and heightened risk taking also plays into the, the value of the alternative, which is relying on the data and the input of others as well. I've also seen, and, and you, you mentioned in the book about the studies on how women also um, they take smaller steps to figure out problems. You know, it, it's it, they have a longer term outlook and it's more of a gradual thing, whereas men tend to lean more towards taking, you know, bigger, you know, trying to trying to fix things all at once. Yeah, there's this idea of d- d- explaining the d- difference between divergent and convergent leadership um, and approach to problem solving. So men are more likely to take a divergent, I'm sorry, a convergent approach. Men are more likely to take a convergent approach and try to focus in on converging in on the problem. What is the problem we need to solve? How can we solve this problem as efficiently and quickly as possible? That's obviously a very useful strategy in many occasions, but here's the value of the opposite of that. Women take a more divergent approach. So they pull on threads, things that may seem tangential, things that may not seem essential to the problem solving, but in doing so, they're painting a bigger picture. They're understanding the forest rather than just focusing in on the tree. And so what I have found is that actually plays into adaptability as well. If you've taken the time to go down those rabbit holes, to explore these things that are not 
in directly attached to solving the problem immediately, then when the situation changes, you'll be at an advantage because you will have already taken the time to understand the landscape better. So the situation changes and all of a sudden this thing that seemed tangential is now really central to the, to the challenge. So I think that that divergent versus convergent is really important to understand. And the fact that men and women tend to have these different approaches is one reason why collaboration between men and women is found to be so effective and drive such successful outcomes. So I think that's the key thing here is that we all need to be aware of these different models of leadership and also partnering with people who think differently than we do. This divergent model, though, that women you know tend to take is again, it's it, it's sort of a longer time frame of of you know getting people together on to make a decision. Um, and then at the same time, you write about how women have to struggle with what you call the confirmatory standard, right? And can you explain what 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 a confirmatory standard is? It's like women always having to confirm with people around them that they know what they're doing. That was yes. A <laughs> so it's these there are these two standards that really impact women. Um, there's the minimum standard, and then there's the confirmatory standards. So the minimum standard is the lower standard, the like, wow, you're not an idiot standard. And it's a lot easier for women to impress people like, oh, gee, you actually know what you're doing. Um, and I write about this in the context, actually, of Gwyneth Paltrow, who's a fascinating case study. Um, and she got plenty of what we call these head pats. They're like, wow, you're not an idiot. You actually are good at running your company head pats. She got the, she got the what you call the stereotype threat, correct? <laughs> yes. Yeah. She didn't want to fulfill the stereotype that she was not going to be a serious CEO because she had come from a background in Hollywood. So the minimum standard is that. And that's why we, and it's easier for women to meet that minimum standard because there is this expectation that they're not going to be good at business because of the stereotypes. So that is why we see plenty of women um, being interviewed for roles. So if you have a candidate pool, you're going to see a lot of women being included in that candidate pool. But women are much less likely to be uh, chosen from that candidate pool and uh, get given a senior role because of this higher standard, which is called the confirmatory standard. And that is the higher standard that women must reach to disprove the stereotype that women aren't as good at business. So they may, re may reach that you're not an idiot role easier, but it's much harder for them to say, I am so impressive that I'm overcoming this long entrenched stereotype that women are, are less good at business as men are. And that's this higher standard that women have to reach in any male dominated field. Um, and it plays into the pattern matching and all of these things. But that's why um, if you see more women included in a candidate pool for a top job, women are still less likely to get appointed to that top job. You know, it's unbelievable as a guy reading this, you said at the beginning of the conversation, how like men would, would be incredulous saying what did such a small amount of women get funding from venture capitalists or they, they have to deal like, we don't, we don't realize this. And this is what this book, you know, what this book just, just shines a light on is that all of the shit that women deal with, even, and you, you, appre you know, the story I had, I used to, um, Gretchen Carlson used to have a show on, on Fox, like during, you know, during the day, during the weekdays. And I used to go on that show like once a month. So I got to know her pretty good. She was always like super capable, despite what SNL used to make fun of her. She was always fine and capable as a good interviewer. And she was very nice. And then she came out with her autobiography um, about her life, like, you know, making her way up through, uh, you know, through the roles of journalism and a TV reporter in local markets and all the shit she had to deal with to get to the level that she was at. And you just, as a, you, I guess you know this already because that's why you wrote the book, but most men just don't realize that, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I mean, it's to me, there are two levels of stories here, right? There are the stories you, you've never heard of before. CEOs like Toy and Ajayi, he was transforming healthcare. Um, and then there are the people you have heard of before, like Gwyneth Paltrow or Reese Witherspoon, I write about, um, or Whitney Wolf Heard, the CEO of Bumble. And what my goal was there is to wow you and surprise you with the parts of their stories that you had no idea about. And this idea um, that Gwyneth Paltrow suffered from imposter syndrome, or she struggled with these dueling standards that we just talked about. I think that's the thing that I think men will be really surprised because they might think they know the story of Jen Hyman and Red the Runway, right? She right. was, she's been on CNBC. You've heard her on TV before, right. um, but these are the stories you haven't heard. And I think whether it's the data or the narratives, there are a lot of surprises in here. It's certainly things that surprise me. And you actually mentioned when you talk about Gwyneth Paltrow and imposter syndrome, that imposter syndrome really affects, you know, significantly more women than men, which also, you know, comes as a surprise to me because I suffer from imposter syndrome. I think everybody does. A lot, right? a lot of people do suffer from imposter syndrome of all genders, but I think it's important to like break down what it is, how it works, how to overcome it, um, and also how prevalent it is um, in order to be able to move past it. 
fair enough. Julia, what is token theory? Token theory is the idea that if someone is in a minority group, that being in a minority is going to draw heightened attention and scrutiny of them. Okay. So for instance, if there are not very many female CEOs, those rare female CEOs are going to draw heightened attention and scrutiny. There are even fewer black female CEOs. They are going to draw even greater attention and scrutiny. Um, and this plays into um, intersectionality and how all of these different identities layer upon each other and draw this higher attention and scrutiny. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about how there have been a lot of takedowns of, of female founders, of startups. And some of that must play into this idea that because they are so rare, they're drawing that extra attention. And one other piece of this sort of impact of rarity is there was a fascinating study that I write about that I really loved this. I, do you remember the one about the jockeys? And it was this study. There's so many, sorry. Yeah, there's so many studies, but there's this great study that shows that the more rare someone is in a role, the more you assume that they're not going to be good at that thing. And it's a right. study that started off with looking at jockeys because horse racing is a very rare sport where men and women actually compete directly against each other. And what these academics found, and they repeated the study in various ways, is that the, the horse races, the types of races in which women had the least representation were the ones where the betting public assumed that women would be the worst. Women were assumed to have the le least capability in the areas where they were least well represented. Mm. And this was a study that was initially done about jockeys, but the findings hold true in any, in any situation. If you don't see someone doing something, you assume they're not going to be good at it. Right. So if one you you see one woman out of a hundred doing something, you're like, well, she must not. Women must not be good at this thing. Otherwise, we'd see more of them. So it becomes a self perpetuating thing, and that's why it's so important to be aware of these unconscious biases, pattern matching, and the impact it can have on so many different things. So we just have a few minutes left. And I, are there so many other questions I have for you? Um, you know, you take some time in the book to to mention you know organizations. Um, that, that have been founded by some really great female entrepreneurs to help other females. And, and I, I want to give a chance to like talk, talk about one or two of them. One of them is, um, it's called The Crew, C-R-U. And I was wondering if um, you can talk a little bit about what that organization does. Yes. So Tiffany Dufu is the founder of The Crew. She also wrote an amazing book, which I, I think about often called Drop the Ball to encourage women not to feel like they have to be perfect at everything all of the time. And The Crew is an, or, is an organization that's helping women navigate business by putting them together in small groups and cohorts um, and teaching them how to coach each other. And what's essential to the approach of the crew and also some similar organizations is this idea that women need to get over their reluctance to ask each other for professional support. And it's creating a new type of relationship. The people who are in your in your crew um, are not your best friends. They're not the people who sit next to you at work. These are people who are coming together to, to learn from each other professionally and uh, give each other advice professionally and also hold each other accountable. And in creating these new this new variety of relationship, um, what Tiffany Dufu is doing is creating an environment where women are in, designed to ask each other for help. And there's some fascinating research about why and how women are more reluctant to leverage their professional relationships than men are. But these structures aim to get women over that and create this structure where women are coaching each other on their on their own behalf. Um, the other thing I would point out is there's some fascinating data about how the strongest negotiators, it's not men, which you might think, and it's not women, but the strongest negotiators are women negotiating on behalf of other people. Women have not fully leveraged that um, negotiating on their skill on their own behalf. But what's so interesting is if you look at what the crew is doing, it's helping women negotiate better for themselves by having them coach each other in that negotiation. So really pushing each other um, and leveraging the power of these small networks, small diverse networks. I'm curious. So if you were running your own business or, you're, or if you're a senior manager at a, you know, a small or mid-sized company, Julia, um, you know, and, and you had the opportunity to join. There's a lot of networking groups, you know, around the country. I mean, I'm thinking of like Vistage is one of them, EO, and um, it's a similar setup. I mean, you know, if you join like a Vistage, it's, you know, you're, you're paired with, you know, 10 or 12 other people that you don't know who are generally CEOs or at your level not in similar organizations, but not in the same industry and you're not competing and you bear all and share all in that group. And I've heard a lot of good feedback from a lot of people that, that belong to Vistage and thinking about it now, they are pretty much all men, but that's besides the point. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, um, 
if you were, you know, if you were running a company or if you're a senior manager of a company and you were like, okay, I'm going to join a, you know, a, a kind of a networking group, a support type of group, would you lean more towards a woman oriented, a female oriented one like the crew, or would you lean more towards one that's, uh, you know, like a vistage, for example, which is not necessarily female oriented, but would give you more of a male perspective? Because I think there are males. In that I order. think, I think if you're a woman, you need both. Right. And I think the more male dominated your industry is probably the more important it is that you have a female network. So if you're in an industry that's more gender balanced, then it's probably less essential to have a separate female network. And I would say join the group that has men and women in it. If you can do both, what re women really should be doing is having a, a small, tight female network and also be participating in organizations that are gender gender balanced or not gender specific. But I do think that the more male dominated the industry, the more that female network offers massive advantages. Great answer. Um, okay, a couple more questions, I'll let you go. Um, uh, you, you, you do have a whole, you write a lot about hiring and regressive hiring practices and um, you know trying to improve diversity in a company. And again, I, you, your audience here, I think are, are, are men who are reading this. You say perhaps the biggest factor in regressive hiring practices is the most familiar one, the resume. Tell me why. Because the resume is entirely reflective of opportunities that you were able to have access to, especially early on for people early in their career, based on the wealth of your parents. And if you look at the, you know, people getting hired straight out of college, the types of colleges they had access to, the internships they had access to, whether or not they were able to do an unpaid internship, those are things that are entirely about the wealth and resources um, and the community that they grew up in, and very little about their own potential. And so one thing I write about is there are all of these amazing um, organizations and companies now that are focused on enabling companies to hire based on potential, not based on experience. And these are tech-based tools, which did not exist five or 10 years ago. One is called Pymetrics. And what they do is they effectively give people games or what are really tests to see what they're going to be good at, what they will be good at. And back to the, the growth mindset and hiring, what matters, especially for people in the first 15 years of their career, is far less what, what internships they did in college mm -hmm. um, and far more what they have the potential to learn. There, we know that upskilling is essential, but I would say that we are living in a time where people have to constantly be learning. The skills you have after three years in the workforce are not going to be what you do 15 years later. What's most important is your ability to keep learning and learning different and new skills rather than just be good at that one thing that you know right out of the bat, right out of the gate. And that's why I think that um, it's so important to think differently about hiring and shift the focus to the potential to learn for this world where everything's going to be changing always, rather than where you are now and who, who you have been in the past, because that's going to have to change as well. Julie, you know, you're definitely an optimistic person. And, and this book is an up, a very upbeat book. I mean, it's factual, it's inspiring. Um, tell me about your thoughts about the future. Uh, you know, I, sometimes I, I look around, um, at our, I don't know if you have kids, I, my, my kids are like in their mid twenties and, um, I look at their generation. It's a, it, it's a nicer, kinder, more diverse generation than mine. You know, I was, you know, I'm on the tail end of the baby boomer generation, you know? Um, and that gives me, it, it gives me optimism for the future. Um, I do see there are a lot of changes happening in the workforce, not just with women, but diversity in general. But I, I just feel like, you know, it, this stuff's going to just, it's going to take time before it changes. And I'm curious what you see the future being like. Do you see a future where, you know, women, you know, will be receiving the same amount of venture capital funding that men do and are running the same number of companies and have the same type of opportunities that men have in this world? Um, I am optimistic. I'm hopeful. My kids are a little younger. They're eight and 11. And from their perspective, they don't understand. And I've obviously talked to them a lot about my book and all the research and stories, and they don't understand some of these gender gaps. They don't make sense to them. Um, the fact that things have always been done some way doesn't make sense that it should continue being that way. If you're talking to an eight-year-old, why think, you know, you have the same cycles perpetuating. Um, so I am fundamentally optimistic in large part because of all the data indicating that diversity is better for business, period. So that's the main source of my optimism. People are, are financially motivated. If they want to make money, they should be investing more in diversity, period. 
I do think things move slowly and I do fear that the pandemic and also this economic downturn could hold back progress. Mm. Um, at the same time, I am optimistic. And what I'm actually hopeful for is not just that there will be equity in investing and investing uh, uh, and leadership, but then men will feel liberated to lead in some of these ways that women have traditionally led. I want to see everyone leading in ways that are more balanced and more authentic to themselves. And I do think that one positive upside of this pandemic and the fact that we're working and living now in a very hybrid, um, volatile, uh, uncertain world is I think that these skills and strategies that women are more likely to lead with are ones that are more, um, more important now than ever and also in the spotlight now more than ever, such as empathy. Um, you can't manage a, a hybrid team of people who are all dealing with their own challenges um, without a little bit of empathy to understand where they're coming from. Or you can't relate to a uh, to a customer who is dealing with record inflation um, if you don't have empathy uh, to, to where they're coming from. So I have sources of optimism, but also concern um, coming uh, out of the pandemic. But fundamentally, we got to follow the data. The data can overcome the bias. The data is going to drive better, show that diversity drives better results. And that's why um, at the end of the day, I do I do think things will continue to change, hopefully at a faster pace than they have been. I think so too. And and one final one final question for you, just your thoughts. The um, there obviously a lot of the, the conversation, you're a tech reporter, a lot of this conversation has to do in the technology industry, which is an enormous industry, uh, you know, in this country. I, you know, you know, it's weird, Julie is like my, my, I have a son who's an engineer, a mechanical engineer. When he went to engineering school in his class of, you know, 150, there were like five women, you know? Um, and yet my daughter is a vet. And when she went to veterinary school in her class of like 150 people, there were like five men, <laughs> you know, it was like a very female oriented, you know, scientific profession but it attracted more women than men, significantly more women than men. And I'm wondering, you know, what your thoughts are about, you know, biological differences between the genders and how that will impact women leadership in certain industries. You know, as you could tell in the book, I really stayed away from the biological conversation. I'm not a doctor. Yep. Um, I'm a journalist. And yep. so everything I write about is really what is socialized. Yep. Women are socialized to be more empathetic. Women are socialized that it's okay to be vulnerable. And I think there is a whole nother book to be written, I'm sure about biological differences, but that was not my book. And that is not my focus. Because I think what's most important here is how we can all learn from each other and we can all feel liberated to take on these, these skills and strategies, even if um, they haven't traditionally been associated with leadership. Because leadership has traditionally been this very male um, male image of a, of a male leader, a guy in a suit, a guy in a hoodie leading in a very top-down way. Um, but I think if you break free from that, and this is not about biology, but what's been sort of taught in our society, that's where you can find opportunity for success. Julia Borston is CNBC senior media and tech correspondent. She has written a great book called When Women Lead, What They Achieve, Why They Succeed, and How We Can Learn From Them. Julia, Thank you so much for spending the time. I learned a lot. I, I highly recommend uh, you know, buying and reading this book to anybody that's running or managing in a company, regardless of your gender. So thanks you for doing it. It's a great book. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Hang on for just a minute. And everybody, thank you so much for watching and listening. This has been Biz Books. My name is Gene Marks. We will be back in another two weeks with another great author like Julia, who has written a great book that we will talk about. Thanks again. We will see you again soon. Take care.